The View from Saturday by E. L. Konigsberg, illustrated by Janan Kane. Genre: Humorous fiction stories are told with humor about things that could really happen. Note those moments of this story that you find humorous. Question of the week: How can different generations be resources? My mother insisted that I write a B and B letter to my grandparents. I told her that I could not write a B and B letter, and she asked me why. And I told her that I did not know what a B and B letter was. She explained, not too patiently, that a B and B letter is a bread and butter letter you write to people to thank them for having you as their house guest. I told her that I was taught never to use the word you are defining in its definition, and that she ought to think of a substitute word for letter if she is defining it. Mother then made a remark about how Western civilization was in a decline because people of my generation knew how to nitpick, but not how to write a B and B letter. I told her that, with all due respect, I did not think I owed Grandma and Grandpa a B and B, and then I stated my case. Fact: I was not just a house guest; I was family. And fact: I had not been their house guest by choice, because fact: she had sent me to them because she had won a cruise for selling more houses in Epiphany than anyone else in the world. And if she had shared her cruise with Joey and me instead of with her husband, my father, I would not have been sent to Florida in the first place. And fact: she, not me, owed them thanks. And further fact, I had been such a wonderful help while I was there that Grandma and Grandpa would probably want to write me a B and B. My brother Joey had been sent to my other set of grandparents who live in a normal suburb in Connecticut. Is Joey writing a B and B to Grandma and Grandpa Eberly? Even as we speak, Mother replied. Well, maybe he has something to be thankful for. I said. Mother drew in her breath as if she were about to say something else about what children of my generation were doing to Western civilization, but instead she said, "Right," and closed my bedroom door behind her. I opened the door and called out to her, "Can I use my computer?" She said, "I know you can use the computer, Noah, but you may not." I was about to make a remark about who was nitpicking now. But mother gave me such a negative look that I knew any thoughts I had had better be about bread and butter and not nitpicking. I gazed at my closed bedroom door and then out the window, door, window, door, window. There was no escape. I took a box of note paper out of my desk drawer. The notes were bigger than postage stamps, but not by much. I took out a ballpoint pen and started pressing it against a piece of scrap paper, making dents in the paper, but not making a mark. Ballpoint pens sometimes take a while to get started. When I was down in Florida, Tilly Nachman had said the ballpoint pen has been the biggest single factor in the decline of Western civilization. It makes the written word cheap, fast, and totally without character. My mother and Tilly should get together. Between them, they have come up with the two major reasons why Western civilization is about to collapse. Not because I was trying to save Western civilization, but because I wanted to actually get my B and B letter written, I put the ballpoint pen back into the drawer and took out my calligraphy pen, the one that uses wet ink. I didn't fill it. I would fill it when I was ready to write. I also took out a sharpened pencil and a pad of post-it notes to jot down any ideas that might come to mind. I wrote "red wagon." The red wagon had definitely been a gift, even though under the circumstances I didn't bring it back to Epiphany with me. I thought a while longer and wrote, "Tuxedo T-shirt." It too had been a gift, but I didn't have. That either, I wrote calligraphy pen and bottle of ink. A wet ink pen and a bottle of ink had been given to me, but the ones I took out of my desk drawer were ones I had bought myself. 
The calligraphy pen made me remember about the post-it notes I had bought to correct the problem that had developed with the ink. Even though I had bought the post-it notes myself, I added post-it notes to my list. I peeled off the post-it note containing my list and stuck it on the wall in front of my desk. And then, as my mother had commanded, I thought again. Century Village, where my Gershom grandparents live, is not like any place I had ever been to. It is in Florida, but it is not exactly Disney World or Sea World or other regular destinations. It is like a theme park for old people. Almost everyone who lives there is retired from useful life. Grandma Sadie and Grandpa Nate fit in nicely. It all started when Margaret Draper and Izzy Diamondstein decided to get married, and the citizens of Century Village called a meeting in the clubhouse to organize the wedding. In their former lives, Grandma Sadie and Grandpa Nate had owned a small bakery right here in Epiphany, New York. So Grandma volunteered to do the wedding cake, and Grandpa Nate, whose chief hobby had always been violin playing, promised to arrange for the music. Mr. Cantor, a retired postman from Pennsylvania who was devoted to growing orchids, said that he would have enough blossoms for the corsages. And Mrs. Kirchmer said that she would lend her African violets for the centerpieces. Tilly Nachman volunteered to do the invitations, and Rabbi Friedman, who was a rabbi in his former life, said he would perform the ceremony even though Margaret Draper was not Jewish and Izzy Diamondstein was. This was a late second marriage, and there wouldn't be any concern about what religion they should choose for their children, since all their children were already grown up and chosen. Grandpa Nate later explained to me that, unlike the average citizen of Century Village, rabbis don't have former lives. They are what they were: once a rabbi, always a rabbi. Many citizens of Century Village were widows who had once been great family cooks, so they formed a committee to plan the wedding dinner. Everyone agreed to share the cost, and they made up a menu and a master shopping list. After that first meeting, Grandpa Nate and I took Tilly Nachman, a former New York City person who had never learned to drive, to the stationery store so that she could buy the invitations. While she shopped for the invitations, Grandpa and I went to Walmart to pick up Grandma's prescription, and that is when we saw the Red Wagon Special. Grandpa bought it for me, and it's a good thing he did. It came in handy until Alan came along. I checked my list, post-it notes. I had bought them when we ran out of invitations. Of course, we didn't run out of invitations until Tilly's cat got its paws into the ink. Tilly was filling in the who, what, when, and where on the invitations when I noticed that she had the prettiest handwriting I had ever seen. Calligraphy, she said. It means beautiful writing, and she asked me if I would like to learn how to write like her. I said yes. She said she would give me lessons if I would help her address the envelopes. So Grandpa drove us to an art supply store where she bought me a calligraphy pen and a bottle of ink. It was while Tilly was trying out various pen points called nibs that she made the remark about the ballpoint pen being the biggest single factor in the decline of Western civilization. After choosing a nib, Tilly said, "I hope in the future, Noah, that you will use a ballpoint pen only when you have to press hard to make multiple carbons." I couldn't promise that. There were times in school when a person had to do things fast, cheap, and without character. Tilly said, "There are pens that come with ink in a cartridge, Noah, but I will have nothing to do with them." So when we were back at her condo, Tilly taught me how to fill a pen, or as she said, how to properly fill a pen. One, turn the filling plunger counterclockwise as far as it will go. Two. Dip the nib completely into the ink. Three. Turn the filling plunger clockwise until it stops. Four. Hold the nib above the ink bottle and turn the plunger counterclockwise again until three drops of ink fall back into the bottle. Five. Turn the plunger clockwise to stop the drops. Six. Wipe the excess ink completely from pen and nib. 
When I told Tilly that six steps seemed a lot to have to do before you begin, she said, "You must think of those six steps not as preparation for the beginning, but as the beginning itself." I practiced my calligraphy. I practiced all twenty-six letters of the alphabet, including X, which was not part of any of the who, what, when, and where's, or any of the addresses, but is a very good letter to practice because fact. It is not easy. When Tilly decided that I was good enough to help with the invitations, I sat on the floor of her living room and used her coffee table as my desk. She sat at the kitchen table. Fact: Many of the domiciles in Century Village do not have family rooms with desks. There was a lot of writing to do because at the bottom of each and every one of those invitations we wrote, "Your presence." But no presents. Tilly said that practically all the invitations that went out from Century Village said that. Besides, she said, I think that making the wedding is enough of a present. I was doing a wonderful job until Thomas Stearns, called T. S. Tilly's cat, pounced into my lap, and I jumped up and spilled the ink, and the cat walked through the spilled ink and onto a couple of the invitations I was addressing. A few. Five altogether now had cat's paws. Tilly was pretty upset because she had not bought extras because she said, "I don't make mistakes." In her former life, Tilly had been a bookkeeper. I heard her say, "I can add up a column of figures with the best of them." I didn't know if she meant the best of the computers or the best of the bookkeepers, and I didn't ask because I was afraid I already knew. I told Tilly not to worry. I told her that I would think of something, and I did. That's when I bought the post-it notes. I put a post-it into each of the invitations that had a cat's paw mark. On the post-it, I wrote in faultless calligraphy, "Bring this specially marked invitation to the wedding and receive a surprise gift." When Tilly asked me what the surprise would be, I told her not to worry, that I would think of something. And I did, but fact, it wasn't easy. On the day the groceries were to be purchased, the citizens of Century Village formed their version of the home shopping network. They met in the clubhouse again. Everyone sat in rows, holding coupons they'd. Clipped since printing began, they asked me to be master of ceremonies. I sat at a table in front of the clubhouse room and called out items from the master grocery list. It was a lot like a game of go fish. I said, "I need one Crisco, four margarines, parive, and let's have all your paper towels." Everyone searched through their fistfuls of coupons and gave me the ones that were needed. Tilly circled the items we had coupons for. Then we checked the newspaper for supermarket specials and made out lists for each of the stores, depending on which one had the best buy in a particular item. I wrote the Gershom list in calligraphy. It didn't slow things down too much, and the citizens of Century Village are accustomed to waiting. Later that day, everyone returned to the clubhouse with the groceries and the store receipts. Tilly added, divided, and straightened out who owed and who was owed, and no one bothered to check because everyone knew that Tilly Nachman did not make mistakes. Then we had to check the grocery list against the menu and who was cooking what. I helped distribute the groceries to the proper households using the new red wagon. Fact: I did a wonderful job. On the day of the wedding, I was in great demand to take things over to the clubhouse in my wagon. The African violets alone took three trips, and the briskets took two. Next, Mister Cantor and I delivered the orchid corsages to the bride and her maid of honor. In the real world, I had never met anyone who spent as much time with flowers as Mister Cantor. Mrs. Draper's maid of honor was to be her daughter, Mrs. Potter. Mrs. Draper used to live in my hometown, which is Epiphany, New York, and her daughter, Mrs. Potter, still does. Mrs. Potter bought a new dress and flew down for the wedding, but we didn't fly down together. I had come weeks before my first trip as an unaccompanied minor. Mr. Cantor and I took flowers over to the groom and his best man to put in their buttonholes. 
Alan, who was Izzy Diamondstein's son, was to be best man. They both live in Florida and have the same last name. Alan Diamondstein still lived in the real world because even though he was Izzy's child and even though he was full grown, he was too young to live in Century Village. Fact: Alan Diamondstein was the most nervous human being I have ever seen in my entire life. Fact. His wife had left him. She had moved to Epiphany and taken a job with my father, who is the best dentist in town. Fact. Alan Diamondstein kept saying, "Isn't it ironic? My father is getting married just as I am getting divorced." This was not the greatest conversation starter in the world. No one knew what to say after he said it. Some cleared their throats and said nothing. Others cleared their throats and changed the subject. I must have heard him say it a dozen times, and I never knew what to say either. At first, I wondered if that was because I didn't know the meaning of ironic. So I looked it up. The meaning that best fits and does not use the same word in its definition is the contrast between what you expect to happen and what really happens. But after I looked it up, I couldn't figure out what was ironic about Alan Diamondstein's getting divorced and Izzy Diamondstein's getting married. The way Alan Diamondstein acted, I can tell you that divorce would be the only possible thing you could expect from marriage to him. And the way Izzy acted around Margaret, marriage would not only be expected; it would be necessary. Sha, a Shonda Fardy Kinder. They were embarrassing to watch, but not so embarrassing that I didn't. Wedding cakes are not baked as much as they are built. In the real world, people don't build wedding cakes; they order in. If you are going to build it yourself, it is not done in a day. It takes three. On the first day, Grandma Sadie baked the layers. On the second, she constructed the cake using cardboard bases and straws for supports, and made the basic icing to cover the layers. On the third day, she made the designer icing for the rosebuds and put the little bride and groom on top. Fact: the cake was beautiful. Fortunately, Grandpa Nate took its picture right after she finished it, so Grandma Sadie can remember how it looked for a little while. Alan Diamondstein would tell you that the red wagon was the problem, but I would say that it's ironic that he should say so. It definitely wasn't. He was. How else were we supposed to deliver the cake to the clubhouse? It was too tall to fit in the trunk of the car, and since on an average day the outside temperature in Century Village is body temperature, there would be a major meltdown before the cake got to the clubhouse where the wedding was to take place. That's when I got the idea to load up the wagon with ice, put a sheet of plastic over the ice, put the cake on top of that, and slowly wheel it over there, with me pulling and Grandpa checking the rear. Grandpa and Nate went to the Jiffy store and bought three bags of ice, and we loaded them into the wagon. Too much, since we didn't want the bed of the wagon filled right. Up to the edge, we emptied some, dumping it out on the cement of the patio. That's where we were going to load the wagon, so we wouldn't have to wheel the wagon down any steps to get it to the meeting room. Just after we loaded the cake onto the wagon, Alan Diamondstein came over to Grandma's. He said his father wanted him to pick up a prayer book, but I think his father sent him because he was making the groom nervous. No one answered when he rang the front doorbell because we were all in the back loading the cake into the red wagon. So he walked around back to the patio. Unfortunately, he didn't see the wagon handle, so he tripped on it, slid on the wet concrete, fell in the puddle of melted ice, and unfortunately toppled the wedding cake. The little top layer was totally smashed. It fell in the same puddle as Alan, and the little bride and groom were seriously maimed. So was Alan's ankle, which fact I detected when he grabbed his foot and started to moan while still sitting in the puddle on the patio. Grandpa Nate called nine one one. Grandma Sadie returned to the kitchen to whip up a repair batch of icing. Grandpa Nate took the remains of the cake to the clubhouse, and I sat with Alan until the ambulance came. He was not good company. The groom called to see what was taking Alan so long. 
I answered the phone, and I thought I would have to call 911 for him, too. Don't panic, I said. I'll be your best man. I did not tell Izzy what had happened to the couple on top of the wedding cake because people get very superstitious at weddings, and no one wants a wounded bride and groom sitting on top of the cake with which they are to start a happy marriage. I had seen that sort of thing often enough in the movies, a close-up of the shattered little bride and groom floating in a puddle of melted ice, signifying the fate of the real bride and groom. So although I had to tell Izzy Diamondstein what had happened to Alan, I didn't say a word about the top of the wedding cake. I didn't think I could convince him that having the little bride and groom fall into a puddle was ironic. He seemed to calm down when I volunteered to be best man, which was about the same time that we found out from the ambulance driver that Alan would be back at Century Village in time for the wedding, even if he probably wouldn't be able to walk down the aisle. As soon as the ambulance took Alan away, I ran over to Mr. Cantor's place and asked him to please, please find another orchid for the top of the cake, although it would be better if he could find two, since the second layer was now the top layer and was bigger. Mr. Cantor found two beautiful sprays of orchids, which Grandma Sadie artistically arranged around the new top layer. Since I had promised to be best man, not having a tux was a problem. I couldn't fit in Allen's, not that I would have wanted to if I could. That's when Grandpa Nate called Bella Dubinsky. In her former life, Bella had been an artist. She painted the pictures that went into the pattern books for people who sew their own clothes. In the real world, I had never met anyone who sewed her own clothes. But in Century Village, I had met three. Bella had a supply of fabric paints, and within two hours we had painted a T-shirt that looked like a tuxedo and a red bow tie. I say we because I helped color in the lines. She drew. It's not easy filling in the lines on T-shirt material. It scrunches up under the weight of the brush, leaving skip marks. You have to go over it again and again. Fortunately, the paints dry fast, and by four o'clock, it was ready to wear. Repaired, the wedding cake looked beautiful. If Alan had not told, no one would have guessed that those orchids didn't belong on top. But Alan told. He told everyone. He also apologized for my being best man. I didn't think that I was someone he had to apologize for. I had helped a lot, and I looked totally presentable in my tuxedo T-shirt, which was a real work of art. Fact: Being best man is not hard. You walk down the aisle with the maid of honor, who in this case was a matron of honor because she is married. I admit that having the son of the groom, Alan, as the best man, would have been a better match size-wise for the daughter of the bride, even though one is married and the other divorced. But the essential fact is that I did a very good job. I stood beside the groom. Mrs. Potter stood beside the bride, and the four of us stood in front of the rabbi. And all five of us stood under a bridal canopy, which I know is called a hupa, and which I think is spelled the way I spelled it. I didn't yawn, sneeze, or scratch any visible thing. I held the wedding ring until the rabbi nodded, and I handed it over. I did an excellent job of being best man, even though when I was under the hoopa, I was under a lot of pressure trying to think of surprises for the cat's paw invitations. The idea came to me at the very moment Izzy smashed the glass, and everyone yelled "Mazel Tov!" Even before Izzy stopped kissing the bride, I knew what I could do. Fact: It was a very long and thorough kiss. It wouldn't be easy. It would mean giving up things I loved, but I had to do it. When everyone except Alan was dancing the hora, I slipped out of the clubhouse and ran back to Grandma Sadie's. I took off my tuxedo T-shirt, folded it nicely, and put it in my red wagon. I found the package of post-it notes. My
calligraphy pen and bottle of ink, and after making sure that the ink was tightly closed, I put those in the wagon too. When I returned to the wedding party, the dance was over and everyone was sitting around looking exhausted. My moment had arrived. I tapped a glass with a spoon as I had seen grown-ups do, and I said, "Ladies and gentlemen, will those lucky few who have the specially marked invitations please come forward? It is time to choose your surprise gift." I saw them pick up their cat's paw invitations and walk over to the band where I was standing beside my red wagon. First, I said, "We have one hand-painted T-shirt, which is an original work of art done by Mrs. Bella Dubinsky. In addition, we have a calligraphy pen, almost new, and a bottle of ink, almost full. These are the perfect instruments for beautiful handwriting. We have one packet of post-it notes, complete except for five." I swallowed hard and added, "And we have one red wagon." Tilly Nockman, who could count precisely, said, "But that's only four gifts, and there were five cat's paw invitations." Oh yes, I said, "The fifth gift is the best gift of all." Everyone asked at once, "What is it? What is it? What is it?" I sucked in my breath until my lungs felt like twin dirigibles inside my ribs. The best gift of all is the very best. The very best gift of all is to give up your gift. A thick silence fell over the room. Then Tilly Nockman started clapping. Soon the others joined in, and I noticed Grandma Sadie and Grandpa Nate looking proud. At first, everyone who held a cat's paw invitation wanted to be the one to give up his gift, but I did not want that. If they didn't take my presence, I would feel as if they didn't matter. Mr. Cantor stepped forward and took the post-it notes. He. Said he could use them for labeling his plants. He said that he was donating an orchid plant as the fifth gift. Then Tilly promised calligraphy lessons to the person who took the pen and ink, and Bella promised fabric painting lessons to the person who took the tuxedo T-shirt. In that way, each of my gifts kept on giving. Four cat's paw gifts were now taken. Only the red wagon remained. Guess who had the fifth cat's paw invitation? Alan, the son of. Alan said he didn't want the little red wagon. He said that he had no use for a wagon in the real world where he was an accountant. When Izzy the groom rose from the table to make a toast, he lifted his glass of wine and said, "Margie and I want to thank all our friends in Century Village." We don't know if we can ever thank you enough for giving our life together this wonderful start. As you know, Margie and I have pooled our resources and bought a little condo on the ocean. Not exactly on the ocean; it is, after all, a high-rise. We will miss the community life here, but we don't want to miss our friends. We'll visit. We want you to visit us. Our welcome mat is out always. We leave many memories behind, and we are also leaving this little red wagon. Every time you use it, please think of this happy occasion. Izzy started to sit down, but halfway he got up again and added, "Consider it a gift to everyone from the best man." He never said which best man he meant, but I'm pretty sure he meant me. Now back in the real world, I sat at my desk and crossed every single item off the list. I didn't have the wagon, the post-it notes, the T-shirt that Bella Dubinsky had designed, or the pen and ink that Tilly Nockman had bought me. I did have a new pad of post-it notes and a new calligraphy pen, both of which I had bought with my own money when I got back to Epiphany. I never had to write a B and B letter when we stayed at Disney World or Sea World. Of course, Century Village is not exactly Disney World or Sea World either. Century Village is not like any other place in Western civilization. It is not like any other place in the entire world. I picked up my pen and filled it properly. The six-step process that Tilly had taught me. She had said, "You must think of those six steps not as preparation for the beginning, but as the beginning itself."
I knew then that I had started my B and B. I let my pen drink up a whole plunger full of ink, and then, holding the pen over the bottle, I squeezed three drops back into the bottle. And I thought, a B and B letter is giving just a few drops back to the bottle. I put away the tiny notepad and took out a full sheet of calligraphy paper and began.